I've been involved in the game now for 50 years as a player, manager and pundit. And it's, it's inevitable, of course, in that sort of span of time that uh, one or two incidents, amusing or otherwise, are going to happen to you. And I'd just like to give you an insight into some of the incidents that have happened to me along the way. That particular altercation I had with, uh, well, it was led to believe it was Andy Gray following a game at um, Southampton when I was manager of Coventry. And we'd gone down there. We'd been, I think, Jason Dodd scored in the first minute, and we had absolutely battered them for the rest of the game. And Dave Bessett, who all seemed to do it against my teams, had an absolute blinder. Anyway, game's over. This is at the old Dell. We're coming in, walking in after the match, and it's a Monday night game. And what happens is, Jeff Shreves, who was the Sky commentator, it was a Sky game, pulls me to one side, says, Ron, can you do a quick uh, down the line to Andy and Richard? Because Andy had been an assistant manager of mine, a good pal of mine, it was, I didn't normally do that. I normally waited for a bit. But that particular time, I said, well, I understand they're pressing. So I go in, put the headphones on, start talking away. And, all I hear, and Richard is saying to me, Ron, you know, do you think, you know, do you agree with Andy when Andy says that uh, they were more committed, they wanted it more than you, they were this, that and the other? Well, I took offence at this. You know, if my team's played badly, I'm the first in the world to own up and say, put hands up, boom. But that particular day, I, and I, I rightly said to them, I've got to tell you, you know, we, we were the, for me, we were the better team. I can't accept that. I can't accept what you're talking about. And it was at the time when they had all those machines and drawing pictures going in different angles. And I said, it's all right if you sat up there I think I said something like this anyway. It's all right for you lot sat up there with your silly machines and drawing that. I've just seen my lads give 110%, work themselves into a, the, the ground virtually, run the socks off, and haven't been able to, because of the brilliance of their goalkeeper, um, haven't been able to win. I said, oh, by the way, who did you vote man of the match? And they've gone, well, the goalkeeper. I said, well, if their goalkeeper was man of the match, we must have been doing something right, mustn't we? So then, with that, I thought, I've had enough of it. I'm going to go in and see, see my players. So I take the headphones off, and I actually just lob them gently across the, across the uh, camera, which appeared that I'd hurled them, because uh, it just bounced off Jeff Reeves, who was the other side of the camera. So I then, I then turn around and go, once again, a step across the camera line, and go to say, are you OK, Jeff? And he said, no, nah, no problem. Turn back. Now, the number of people that actually thought I'd gone to hit him. They thought I'd gone to chin Jeff. And Jeff had been in my house two or three days earlier having a drink. Anyway, so he didn't, I, did, I didn't really realise the significance of it. Went back, into the, uh, went back into the boardroom later on, into the guest lounge, said to the players, bad luck, lads. You play like that, you'll win more than you lose. Go in there. And all of a sudden, everybody's clapping their heads off. You know, well, oh, really, what's, you, go, you sorted them out. I'm thinking, what's gone on? Because I hadn't really realised, when you're doing the interview, you don't really realise quite what's gone on. So anyway, people, Andy rang me straight afterwards. He said, I've had a go at Richard over that. He was out of order, this, that and the other. I never saw it. I, I did the Chris Evans live TV Friday night show. And he, he showed it to me that night. And I'm thinking, well, where, where's Andy in all this? It was never Andy, it was Richard. Now, Richard's problem, where Coventry City are concerned, is... Although he's, a, although he's a, a pundit and a commentator and a presenter, he's also an avid Sky Blue fan. And I thought that night maybe his frustration at not winning the match or not getting the points for the team he supports, if you like, overcame his professional judgment. That was all right afterwards. We were playing Nuts County when Neil Warnock uh, was manager. Now, Neil for whatever reason, has got this, this habit of antagonising people. He can put people's backs up. The previous year I'd been at Sheffield Wednesday, I'd had two big run-ins with him. So now, we, now we, we're coming to play them at Villa Park. And he, had, he, he built a good side there, Warnock, at uh, Nuts County. Anyway, I say to Andy Gray before the match, Andy's my assistant manager, every match we'd played, Andy had been in trouble. He'd, had, he'd won it the first match, he'd won it a wrestle and fight with Alex Ferguson. We played Arsenal, he wants to have a go at George Graham. You know what I mean? It, he was that, he, 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 was, he was a feisty character he played and he, he carried that over onto his touchline uh, behavior. And I was constantly getting letters from the FA about him. So before this particular game against Notts County, I said, look, I'm telling you now, 
Andy, this fella, Warnock, is a nutcase. He's, I don't mean that in the nicest possible way. Um, I don't want you getting involved with him at all, because if you do, and you go to the FA, you sort it out yourself. I'm not, I'm not, you've been warned. I'm not sorting it out for you. Okay? So the match starts. I took my position up in the stand at Villa Park. The game is awful. It's November, it's freezing, it's awful. Well, I'm sitting there going, oh, what are we like? So I picked my phone up to ring down to the bench to tell him to tell Tony Daly and Daly and Atkinson to get wider, get wider, get more width in our play. The phone doesn't work. For, some, for whatever reason, the phone's not working, so I slam the phone down. I've got Steve Stride, who's a great lad, the Villa secretary, sat alongside me. I start giving him stick. I start on about, look, the phone, and you know when you talk about managers going mad, you're in the heat of the game, I'm going, the phone, them two wingers, you. And it, Steve, bless his heart, says, it's the GPO, it's not my fault. I said, the GPO's got nothing to do with them wingers, not playing, anyway, so I'm, I've gone. I come down, walk down, and it's, you have to come down the stairs, quite a long walk along the track to get it to the dugout. Sorry, I'll get that right, because you shouldn't say dugout at Villa Park, because the chairman, Mr. Ellis gets very sort of paranoid about it. So I'm walking along the, anyway, big Cyril Regis gets us a goal. Heads one in, I think, oh, I've done the trick. It's worked. Get in the dugout, I said it again. They're open, they're open trainers boxes, as we'll call them from now on. Still got my piece of paper rolled up from, with my notes on it and all that. The game is still awful. The game's terrible. So anyway, Big Cyril Regis, who, you know, he was like a man mounted Big Cyril. They just put a boy, I think his name, Tony Agana. I think they paid 750 grand for him. Anyway, he gets involved in a clash with Big Cyril, which is not the cleverest thing to do at the best of times. Flattened his down. Warnock now goes on the pitch, Neil, and he's saying, get him whacked, kick him, get him sent off. And now I'm sitting there, booted and suited, still standing up as it. I've got my roll of paper. I oh, think you cheeky so and so. So I start getting up. So I get back in there. Go on, get in here. And I'm whacking him on the back of the head with this roll of paper, like, you know. So he gets back in, and the, like, oh, he, it's not bad as well when you're in front of your home fans. They're all going, go on, Ron, give him one. Whack, whack, whack. I told you, get in there, get in there. I walk back in there thinking, sorted him out. Come on, lads. I go, and I've stood, I'm telling you, booted and suited, I've stood in the biggest bucket of ice cold water you can see. You've never seen one bigger. And only one person in the whole ground seen it, Andy Gray. And Andy starts to go, I said, Andy, you keep your mouth shut. I'll stand in this water, you say one word and you're sacked. And, I'm, and I start pointing my finger over there so everybody's head's turned that way. I go, whip it out a bit quick and stand there. Till, now, after the game, uh, Neil Warnock's assistant came in, uh, Mick Jones, we told him the story, he was in fits, you know. We never told Warnock. The time I told Neil Warnock was about, I would say four years later when he was manager of Plymouth and I was manager of Coventry, we're playing him in the cup. I said, I've got to tell you something now. And then Mick Jones, who was with, also with him at Plymouth, Mick Jones said, I've got to tell you, Neil. I've known about this for four years, like, you know. Actually, and now I saw it with Warnock, I say, I'm the only fellow in the game that likes you, you know, so you've got to behave yourself with me. We played, um, when Glenn Hoddle's manager of Swindon, we played Swindon in the, in the FA Cup down at the county ground. And in all fairness, they should have beaten us. Well, they certainly should have got a draw at the game. We beat them 2-1. Uh, Steve Frogger got a great goal for us. Right at the end, uh, I think it was Tony Daly, one of the players let one of their guys run. We win the game, so we go in the dressing room afterwards. I say to Andy, Andy, go on, have your crack now. I'm not going to say anything. We've won the game. I want you to go in and get hold of them and give them a right good shake up because, you know, just to remind them, although we've won, we haven't performed anywhere near as well as we might have done. So I walk out the dressing room and stood by the door talking and Andy's ripping into two or three of them. He's ripped so hard into one of the players that I've got to tell you, the player is virtually, well, he's all, he is in tears. There's no question. And Andy's going, and I've walked in, I said, well done, lads. Hey, you've done ever so well to the player. He'd had to go, well played today. And Andy's looking at me and said, you've just told me to rip his head off. I said, I know, but that's what managers do. 
one of the most publicised uh, embarrassing moments I've ever had was uh, the opening day when I joined Nottingham Forest. I was actually in Barbados, as you would be, before a match when I got the call, would I like to be manager and this, that and the other. And I kept talking to Irving Scholar, who's the uh, chief executive, saying, yeah, I'm interested, but what's the scenario? I know you're not doing well in the league, but where are you? You know, he's towards the bottom. Anyway, he said, Ron, we've, if we're going to do it, we've got to get this heads of contract thing sorted out. And all I wanted to know was the fixture list and just exactly where they were in the league. And he said, Ron, if I fax you this, this deal, we'll sign that. So he faxes me to Barbados, I sign it, heads of agreement, send it back. He then sends me the fixture list. There are about eight points at the bottom of the league about eight points behind the next team. And I'm thinking, and then we play, the first three games are Arsenal. Uh, I think it was Arsenal, Everton away, Arsenal, Everton away, Man United and Chelsea. And I, that, those are our first four games. I thought, blimey, I thought, that's the case. We'll need snookers after February if, if, if we're going to stay up. So anyway, we'll have a go. I ring Peter Shreves, do you fancy coming in with me? Peter Shreves said, yeah, I'll have some of that. So I fly back. I wasn't going to fly back till after the Arsenal game. That was the original idea. But they said, come on, you, we need you here today. So I flew back late on the Friday night. And as you can well imagine, it's, you know, it's quite a, you do have a fair bit of jet lag, particularly flying through the night. Get to Gatwick. I get the car brings me up to um, Nottingham, meet the players for the first time about half an hour before the kickoff. And then I'm going out to, to the game, like, you know, the team have gone out and gone and there's a whole battery of cameramen in front of me you know it's, they're right in front of me so I'm walking through and I'm thinking I see the dugout I think oh I'll have that getting the dugout and they're all going clicking away clicking away I'm going yeah 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 I just happened to glance over my shoulder I see uh, Nelson Vivash I think it was Nelson Vivash uh, Mark Overmers and Dennis Burkham and I'm thinking, how are we bottom of the league with players like that in our side? What had happened, obviously what had happened, I got in the wrong dugout. So people have all gone, oh, wait, you don't even know where the dugout is. But there's another story to this, which, you, which maybe excuses why I did that. Over the years at Nottingham, and it was a cluffy thing, the visitors only ever had, the tunnel at Nottingham is at the bottom end of the ground. You come out there, and for all the years, the visitors had a little, little shed, I'll say nothing more than that, on the left. You might as well have been in the Trent watching the match. Cluffy had his right on the half one. It was the only dugout that side. And I thought that, I thought that this was the one, you know, I thought, I thought this is when I'd always seen Cluffy saying. One day when I was played, when we played Cluffy's Forest, this was with West Brom. Great, they had a great team, we had a good team. They beat us 2-1, but after the game, I've congratulated him and Peter Taylor. I said, but by the way, what is, that's out of order, that dugout down there. You shouldn't, you shouldn't allow that, that's out of order. And Peter, Cluffy didn't comment to be fair, but Peter Taylor just started laughing. He said, you know what, that's for Rondo, you know. Yes, not very good down there, is it? And I thought, like you, bugger. Anyway, so subsequently later in the season, we're playing, they, they've got to come to the Hawthorns and it's a horrible day, it's January. Both of us are still doing ever so well in the league. It's, but what had happened at the Hawthorns, they'd knocked the old stand down, they'd rebuilt half of what is now the, now the dressing room side. And, in the, and having rebuilt half of it, they built a home dugout at the front of that, beautiful. To the left was nothing but JCBs, tractors, diggers and all this and whatever, and it was mucky and sloshy and all this, because they, you know, they got to complete the rest of the stand. Saturday morning, I go in, get hold of the grounds, and I says, hey, because they put a temporary, we'd get, I'd get my dog out there, the visitors was there, temporary one. So I went down, I said, hey, get that. Take it right down in that corner, in, amongst all those tractors and everything, and I'll tell you what, nail it to the ground. Make sure it cannot be moved, whatever. Game, great game, we beat them 2-1. We always had good games with Forrest. We beat them 2-1, so I'm now waiting. It's, it's bucketed down with rain. They come traipsing up, Brian and Peter Taylor, and they've gone, just going to shake hands. They've just got to say something. I said, horrible, isn't it? Hey, 
Now you know how we feel when we come to your place. But the, that, that is the reason why I'd never been to Forest before when the visitor's dugout was in where, where it should have been for years. Often when you sign a new player, one of the quandaries you have is where to play, put him in the team straight away, or maybe let him, particularly if he's a foreign player, let him settle in and find out what's what before, before thrusting him into the limelight. I have to tell you, I would think the most harrowing debut any player has ever had, certainly under my regime, uh, was a guy named John Siverbeck. Story with John, I'd seen him play two or three weeks earlier for uh, Denmark against the Republic of Ireland in Dublin. He had been, he was a flying machine. He's still one of the quickest, he's as quick as any footballer I've ever worked with John. So we signed him on the basis of that. And that particular day, he had, and we, we joke about it now because the lad's a good mate of mine, John, Jim Beglin. He had raced Jim Beglin all over the place. He had cut him to ribbons. So anyway, I signed John and he, he cut, turns up in England on the Thursday. Limited, limited English. Um, so I said to him, John, how do you fancy playing at Anfield on, on Sunday? It was a Sunday game. And Liverpool, Man United games were, are, and always will be. They are the absolute, oh, I'll tell you what, you can have any derby match. They, they are, they're a derby match plus. So, well, you know, if you're asking me to play, I said, not only am I going to ask you to play, I'm going to ask you to play right side of forward midfield. We had a few injuries. I said, because... Their left back's Jim Beglin, who you played against a few weeks ago and absolutely cut to ribbons with your pace. And I think maybe, just maybe, you could do it there. And I think deep down he didn't really want to play. I think he, th I think he thought he'd have liked a bit of uh, time to settle in, but, you know, needs must. So anyway, the Sunday game, we travel over on the Sunday morning to Anfield. And we used to have a standing joke. Whenever we got to Anfield, because, you know, now being funny, the Liverpool lads have got this reputation of being scallies. Somebody, one of the players, it might have been Gordon McQueen normally or somebody like that, would always shout, don't forget lads, put your hands over your wallets as, you, as you're diving out, like, you know, to, to, the, uh, to the dressing room. Standard patter. Anyway, this particular time when we turn up, you, could norm you normally always used to be able to pull up close to the dressing room door at Anfield and just get straight in. Because they'd done some ground development and there was an overhang, the coach pulled considerably further away from the dressing room door than we'd ever done in the past. And there was a flood of Liverpool fans there and noticeably no policemen. So the usual cry goes out, hang on to your wallets, this, that and the other. And so we dive, try to dive through the crowd to get to the dressing room door. As we get to the dressing room door, I, I personally felt, oh, blimey, what's that? My first reaction was there was something it was in your nose, your eyes and everywhere. I actually thought that they put some special paint on the door or something and the fumes had come off it. And I had lads coughing and spluttering and this, that and the other. And now I'm, I've guessed something's up. I'm, I'm, I'm right angry now and I go, go down the tunnel to get to our dressing room and I can see a figure in front of me. I've got to be honest, I took to be one of the Liverpool players. So as I walked past him, I just threw him out the way against the wall, walked in, coughing and spluttering. Few, few of the lads weren't bad. Some were, some were in quite a serious state. Clayton Blackmore, I remember, couldn't play. He wouldn't have been able to play. He was that bad. Anyway, the upshot, if it's all is, Mick Brown comes in to, after the game. He said, I tell you, and John didn't have the best of games. He didn't have a good game. I took him off after about an hour and said, a bit disappointed in him today. You know, I thought he'd have done better. Mick Brown, my assistant manager, said, Ron, do you realise you brought a lad over here three days ago, can't speak the language, we're playing at Liverpool in a very, very important game, you're playing him out of position, and if that's not bad enough, you assault him before the match. When I walked down the tunnel, it was actually him, and it's on a video of Kenny Dalglish, I think, I threw him against the wall. He recovered, though. He, was, uh, he went on to win a European Championship with Denmark later on. Over the years, I've been involved in a lot of big transfer deals. Um, you know, like Brian Robson, people like that. Massive money. But one of the funniest, one of the funniest deals I've ever done was in my early days. I'm at Cambridge United. And one of the great things, you know, when you're managing at that level, there's, there's a great camaraderie amongst the various managers. You get to know, you probably get to know the other managers better at that level than anything. 
And one of the characters that knocked about the scene then, and he's still about, and we've seen him on this, is Mad Barry, ba Baza, Barry Fry. What a laugh he is. And I, I had some great times with him. And uh, sorry, I'm going to say is, I'm at Cambridge. He's at uh, Dunstable, Dunstable Town, yeah. So I'd got a left back who'd done very well for me the year before. We'd won promotion and whatever. Um, it was part-time, a lad named Billy Baldry, good lad. But because we'd stepped up a grade and he was still working, he worked at Vauxhall Motors actually, it meant that you know, he was gonna be lagging behind. So the board of directors said, you know, um, really you ought to get him off the wage bill then if he's not gonna really figure in your plans. And I, Barry fancied him. And I always thought there was a chance of getting good money out of Barry for him, but it wasn't to be. And I had a bit of the, one of the chairmen, the chairman said to me, look, we need, oh, get, just get him off the wage bill. So anyway, this particular chairman, by the way, it was all right, but he'd had a pop at me the previous Wednesday for, for it, after we beat, we beat Berry, Berry, I think it was, to go top of the third division. We, when I went there, we were bottom of the fourth. So within sort of two years, we're top of the third, which was good going. And uh, I'd had a few bottles of wine after the match with John Bond, who'd come over from Norwich. And I think the total bill had come to 50 quid or something. And I'm thinking, he starts moaning at me for that, like, you know, I'm thinking, hang on a bit. I've hardly spent a penny on the team. We've gone up sort of 20, 40 places sort of thing, and he's having a pop. So anyway, so I rang Barry, I said, I'll tell you what, forget what I'm asking for a fee, because you're not going to pay it. The, the board say it can go, you can, just to get him off the wage bill, you can have the lad. I said, all I'm saying to you now, if you come over here with a crate of moe, so I can put it in our little stock room there for after matches, you can have it. So about what, I'll have that, you know, Barry, I'll have some of that big man, yeah, come over, yeah, yeah, yeah. Flies over, flies. Comes in his Corsair or whatever else, comes over. Straight, boom, there's your lad, you've got him, plays. Two games later, two weeks later, he rings up and says, Ron, old Billy is not the player I thought he was, you know. He's, he seems to have gone a bit. I said, Basil, get yourself over here again. He drives over, I said, look, there's two bottles back now, clear off. <laughs> you've had him on the cheap. <laughs> but it draws up to tricks, oh, some great tricks. I mean, I can remember one day, it's a true story, this, um, there was a lad, I'm trying to think now whether he was, he might have been an amateur with us, I'm not sure, when I was at um, Kettering. And I used to go over to watch Stevenage play a lot because I got some good mates there. And they got this wonderful lawnmower that they never used. Anyway, cut a long story short, I went, they wanted one of our young players. I said, I'll tell you what, you give us that lawnmower, you can have him. So we had the lawnmower off them. The lawnmower, I actually took West Brom there 10 years later for a testimonial for the, uh, for the lawnmower. It did that much service. I don't think the kid played many games. But you, you were always doing tricks like that. There was, there was some great fun. And in many ways, it's a shame, but in many ways, I still think that's possibly the best learning place for most managers, if they can start lower down. Ah, oh, talking about Barry as well. He has a blinder, you know. I mean, he, he's had some sort of career as a manager, Barry. He has, he's sold his house three times. He's had about 42 heart attacks. He's, he runs up and down the field after, when they celebrate a goal. I played against him. He never ran that quick when he played. Like, you know, he's unbelievable. But heart as, heart as big as, you know, big-hearted guy, great guy. He tells a great story about when he was at um, Barnet. And they had this chairman, Stan Flashman. Stan was actually, he was a real scallywag and king of the ticket touts and everything. And, but he'd bought Barnet to town. So they played a game on the Saturday and they got a centre forward. I think his name was Harry Willis, big centre forward. On the Saturday, it had a nightmare. It had an absolute nightmare. So Stan calls them both, he calls him and he goes in the dressing room, he says straight to this Harry Willis, you ain't never going to play for this club again. You're useless. It gives him all sorts of stick. Yeah. And Barry's having a go, I'll pick the team. You don't tell me you picked the team off. You know, and I, you can imagine there's a bit of choice lingo going about. Anyway, when it's all quieting down, they've got a game on Tuesday night. So Barry says to the kid, you're playing. He said, I can't. He said, he's actually, I think he'd kneecap me if I, you know, 
If I come, the way he was trying, he said, look, I'm telling you, you're playing, we won't say anything. What we'll do, we'll smuggle you in. They've got, they got a training ground apparently around the back. We'll smuggle you in there, get you into the ground, go out last, just before the kickoff, play, he can't do a thing. And the kid's still not convinced he's going, yeah, but if, I, if you know, I don't fancy being able to walk with no kneecaps and things like that. But I said, don't say no, no, it's a bit. Anyway, they play the game on the Tuesday night. They win about five. The kid, Willis, gets a hat trick. Oh, as soon as he comes in after the match, chairman wants to see you and Barry up in his office. So the kid walks in like he thinks, oh, what's going to happen now? Barry walks in, Stan Flashman looks at him and says, Barry, that's motivation for you. <laughs> I've had teams in, the, in European competitions, and I think that's great. I think it's great being in European competitions because it makes you... Whatever you are in the league or whatever, it makes you weak, you know, looking forward to a European match. And uh, the normal procedure is you, unless it's too far in Europe, you usually fly the day before and you always go to the ground. I, I used to love that. I used to love going to the, the big grounds the night before and pinging a few balls about and things like that. And it took something to stop me doing that. I must admit, I used to love taking free kicks against the goalkeepers in, like, the, in Barcelona, in the... Uh, San Siro and places like that. And one of the trips we went on, we were actually at this Aston Villa. We're playing in the San Siro. Going to play into Milan next night. So we get there, we're just ready to train. And I have to tell you, the heavens, absolute. And it took, it used to take something to get us off the ground. The heavens absolutely opened up. And it was coming in, it was coming down in sort of rods. It was so bad. We all had to clear off the pitch except for one person. The middle of the pitch, and we could see him, it was almost like one of those discotheque things where it's sort of like lights shading him, was big John Fashnow, albeit not a footballer, just going around the centre circle doing all sorts of karate movements. Well, the Italians were just looking at him, they couldn't make out what it was. They're saying, he plays, he plays? Yeah. Overall, I suppose, football's been very kind to me. You know, it, I mean, it's something I've been reasonably well paid for doing something that I love. It's also given me the opportunity to travel the world at somebody else's expense. And that's, that's an eye-opener. I mean, we actually, <laughs> I was actually manager of West Bromwich Albion when we were the first football team from the Western world ever to play in China. I mean, that, that, was a, that was an unbelievable cultural experience, but it doesn't always rub off on the players. I can remember one day, and we had, a, we had I think it was BBC television crew were with us, filming a documentary, and uh, one day we were, you know, one of the great seven wonders, one of the seven wonders of the world, the Great Wall of China. So we're on there. Reporter, I think it's Julian Pettifer, goes up to one of our players, and that's when John Truick made a comment which might be leg legend in soccer sort of quotes. They said, Julian apparently said to him, what do you think of the Great Wall, John? I suppose when you've seen one wall, you've seen them all, ain't you? <laughs>